Uh, my name, as I said before, is Andrew. I'm the executive director here at MREA, and welcome to the Exploring Energy series. Um, MREA is a non-for-profit organization based in Missoula, Montana, um, and our mission is to foster the growth of renewable energy for all Montanans through education, advocacy, and industry engagement. I like to say that we are a hub for renewable energy education and advocacy across the state. And a lot of our education work focuses on trying to help people understand energy technology, trends, and issues. And our Exploring Energy series is part of that mission and, and part of our outreach programs this year. Um, today, I'm excited to dive into this topic of microgrids. It's something that I've been very interested in for a long time, as have a lot of people in the MREA community. Um, and I feel like there's a lot more kind of buzz coming up about microgrids uh, around the country. So I'm very excited to bring in uh, three speakers today, and I'm going to read their bios really quickly here at the beginning, and then I'll let them uh, introduce themselves as well um, as we go through the presentation. So first we have Kira Zeidelman. She is the technical manager at the Center for Partnerships and Innovation at the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, or NARUC, where she manages cooperative agreements with the U.S. Department of Energy on coal-fired power, natural gas distribution, nuclear energy, and microgrids. She develops technical assistance for state public utility commissions across these topical areas, coordinating webinars, briefing papers, trainings, workshops, and other resources. Prior to joining NERU, Kira was an analyst with ICF, providing regulatory support, research, and economic analysis to federal rulemaking efforts. Kira has a master's degree in public policy from Georgetown University and a bachelor's degree from the University of Maryland. Uh, next, we'll be joined by Kelsey Jones. Kelsey supports the National Association of State Energy Officials, the uh, Electricity and Energy Security Programs, where she conducts research and analysis on a variety of state electricity and energy security policy and program issues, including microgrids and cybersecurity. Prior to NASIO, Ms. Jones worked at the Nuclear Energy Institute, assisting the political affairs and advocacy programs. She also worked as a graduate research assistant studying renewable energy development in Arctic cities. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of Florida and a Master of Environmental Resource Policy from the George Washington University. Alex Pina, our third presenter, is a director at Converge Strategies, working at the intersection of infrastructure resilience, clean energy, and national security. He focuses on the impact of wide-scale power outages and developing cost-effective solutions to address those impacts. Prior to Converge Strategies, Alex worked at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, where he developed an exercise program to identify vulnerabilities in energy infrastructure and an analysis tool that compares the techno-economic benefits of solutions. Alex holds a master's in sci of science in engineering and management and a bachelor of science in aerospace engineering from MIT. Um, so thank you again. I'm very excited to hear from all of you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and I'll pass it over to Alex to begin the presentation. Great, thanks, Andrew. Appreciate the introduction and appreciate you all joining today. Uh, you know, we'll have three presenters here. I have the pleasure of kicking off and, and starting to talk a little bit and, and a bit of background on what microgrids are. Uh, so here's the the three presenters. If we go to the next slide, I'll try and explain a little bit of why there's three of us. Why isn't there only one? Uh, Nayer Gnazio and CSL have collaborated on a number of topics, uh, primarily related to uh, resilience, the grid. Um, and particularly the most recent one that you'll hear a fair amount about today uh, being the value of resilience for microgrids. So we'll talk about all those three. Um, we work together a lot, and that's the reason why you have three of us here and uh, talking to you all and, and trying to bring those different perspectives to really help understand what microgrids are and what they can potentially do for you, your communities, and, and the regions that you're thinking about. Next slide, please. So Converge Strategies, Oh, why are we here? Uh, the biggest thing, and, and you may have heard it a little bit in my bio, is that we really try to focus on what happens when the power goes out. And when it does go out, what can you do about it? Uh, and, and primarily, how can you prepare yourself for that? And microgrids are just one of the solutions. And so we've had three projects that I list here that are available on the web. You can, you can research them and learn more about them. Uh, first one is really looking at communities. And saying, if your community, if you're um, trying to really see what you can do if the power goes out, let's say you're a public health center uh, and the power goes out, how can you actually keep the services going for those people without having to move them 
across the street to a different location or potentially just leaving them in the dark. Uh, the second project reset was actually us working with the DOD to figure out how they could take the assets they already have. Uh, for example, they have a lot of large solar fields at their installations that currently don't provide power during an outage. How can you convert those so that they actually provide power? And working with microgrids is one of the ways and one of the methods of providing that resilience for the grid outage. And the last one is just on, on air, airport microgrid implementation toolkits. So helping airports think about the steps that they need to do to identify what the requirements are, how much power they need, and then how they would actually develop a microgrid to keep the power up um, when it goes out at the greater grid. Next slide, please. So as I'm talking about this, I've said microgrid a couple of times. Some of you may be familiar with the concept, but I really like to break it down as simple as I possibly can. And the way I think about it is that there's two main aspects that really define a microgrid. There are a lot of others and there's many definitions, but for me, the simplest two is that it needs to be local. And what I mean by local is that you have the generation and the load in the same place. And I guess what I continue to mean by that is I have a generator at my home and that's a microgrid. I'm able to keep that local. I don't have to worry about a central power plant bringing power in across the transmission distribution system to then get to my home because it's no longer local at that point. The other criteria that I think about is that it's independent. Uh, what I mean is that you aren't relying on another entity necessarily. You're not relying on someone who isn't part of your network, isn't part of your community, isn't part of that local area. So you are able to operate this system on your own um, or potentially with some, some help, uh, maybe technical help, but you are making decisions for when you have power, what you have power from and how it operates as opposed to the grid, um, you know, with our regular utility where we just you know, turn on lights and, and plug in things and get power. We don't have any control of how that power is generated, how that power gets to us, or essentially even how that power is made. So this is a, a, a kind of a differentiator there between those two. Next slide, please. So I mentioned a little bit about the, the what could constitute a microgrid. Here are some examples try and make it a little bit more concrete. Again, I know I understand this can be a, an unfamiliar term uh, and it's, it can be sometimes vague depending on who you're talking to, but the easiest ways for me to think about it is three, these three sets. So in your first set, starting on the left, is where you have, maybe you have solar and storage at your home, uh, maybe you even have a generator. But in those cases, in the, the strict definition that I'm working with here, that's a microgrid. It's local. Again, your generation power is right at your house, and it's also independent. You're controlling that. You're deciding how it works and how it's being used. Really, if you want to scale up complexity and scale up the amount of people, then you have this middle one I'm talking about here where you're looking at potentially a campus. So think about a university, maybe a hospital, uh, could also be a couple of buildings as all grouping together and receiving local power and local decision authority over how they get that power if there's an outage. Again, trying to make sure that they can keep their operations going, but instead of each of them doing it independently, they, they work together essentially to, to provide and, and pull those resources. The last one is, again, the same principles, being local and being independent, but it's on a much larger scale. So now you're talking about a community. You're talking about maybe a city or a, a major part of a city that has uh, pulled together to use the, the distribution system that's already there from the utility, like all the overhead lines, using those to provide somewhat local at this point power um, and maybe large power plants or large solar fields to provide power for all those people. So it's no longer just for um, businesses in this case, but you're also providing it for homes. It's really all the functions that you have in a community trying to power that together under one roof and one pool of resources, as opposed to having, again, a bunch of small individual microgrids, if you will, in kind of that, that home and that first method of everything being individualized. So as you scale up, it gets more complex. There's more moving pieces. Uh, it becomes, um, safety becomes a larger issue in terms of how to protect it and make it work. But the principles are the same between these three. Again, it all comes back to having your own power 
and having control over when and how that power is used. Next slide, please. And this, I wanted to, to highlight this one here as a way of showing that even within the community of practitioners and the folks who day in, day out are really working through microgrids and trying to make them happen, there's still a little bit of difference. And, and I, you know, we pulled up the map here of what the Department of Energy has listed as microgrids that are in the United States, and they only had one for Montana. And I, I kind of th thought to myself, well, I'm relatively confident there's more than one, but this is just how DOE is looking at it and the ones that they have listed in their database, but there's more than this. And so even though some folks may talk about microgrids as these you know, really massive projects that are helping an entire community, it goes much further than that. And so more things that may be microgrids than what you hear about, and they're, they come in many different flavors and sizes. So I just wanted to, to highlight that. Next slide, please. Now, even though this says summary, and even though there are hard numbers on here, I don't want anyone to think that these are the only ranges or the only applications or even the, the benefits and challenges that you can have with a microgrid. I wanted to provide essentially something on a, a dartboard, something for you to, to look at a pinpoint and say, all right, this is roughly the direction that we go with microgrids and understand that that can be pretty broad and, and pretty varied from there. And another way, and as you're looking at that picture of trying to figure out what a microgrid is and, and, and what it can do and, and whether you can do it or whether you need help, is it really comes down to the scale and the complexity. Um, unfortunately, unlike generators, unlike solar and battery, microgrids are not yet at a place where you can just buy it off the shelf. Can't go to the hardware store, pick it up. You can't really order them online. Um, there's still some needed engineering and development to essentially configure and program this technology to work for you and the assets that you have. So, it, it's not off the shelf yet. I think they're, they're trying to go that direction, but just as you're keeping in mind, um, this isn't uh, like the rest of the technologies and it does require sometimes a little bit of help if you're doing anything other than that first example of, of having it connected to the house. Next slide, please. And when I talk about microgrids growing, microgrids have existed for a while. I'd say that the, the technology and the ramping uh, was kind of stagnant. Until, uh, until technology actually really developed here, probably about the past 10 years or so, there's been a large scaling of, of, of microgrids and their applications and what they could do, but there's a lot more development that's gonna happen. Uh, one of the things that is going on right now is a discussion of how electric vehicles can work with microgrids and support them and support communities. And that's primarily not just providing electricity to the electric vehicle, but can the electric vehicle actually provide electricity to your home? Can it provide it to businesses? Can it be used if the power grid does go down? Can it be used like a battery um, instead of as a car? So there's other, the, the standardizing of components and things like that that I mentioned. So I won't go over all of these, but just understand that this is still a developing field and hopefully it'll get to a point one day where it's just like how we have it for uh, generators, uh, solar and battery and those other technologies that you may use. So with that high level um, ground setting, hopefully, I'll go ahead and pass it off to Kelsey, who's going to continue talking a little bit more. Uh, thanks, Alex. This is Kira. And I think um, just uh, before we get to Kelsey's presentation, we just had a couple of slides about each of our organizations. Um, so we're going to go over those first just to give you a better idea of who we're representing. Um, so I work for NARUC, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. Um, and we represent public service commissions or public utility commissions in all 50 states and US territories. Um, in Montana, it's the uh, Montana Public Service Commission would be our member. Um, and NARUC's mission is to serve the public interest by improving the quality and effectiveness of public utility regulation. And our members oversee electric, gas, telecommunications, and water utilities uh, via rate setting and other regulatory powers. And we have uh, departments dedicated to policy and advocacy where we represent um, the perspectives of state utility regulators um, to the federal government. Uh, we have an international office that works on capacity building and technical assistance to energy regulators in developing countries. 
Uh, we facilitate meetings and events to help our members share knowledge with each other and hear from experts throughout the industry. Uh, we also have a 501c3 research arm called the National Regulatory Research Institute. And then my office, the Center for Partnerships and Innovation, is a grant-funded technical assistance office for state public utility commissions. And I'll turn it over to Kelsey now to talk a little bit about NASIO. Thanks, Kira. Hello, everyone. As was mentioned earlier, my name is Kelsey Jones, and I'm a program manager for electricity and energy security at NASIO, the National Association for State Energy Officials. We're a national nonprofit that represents the 56 state and territory governor designated energy offices. And state energy offices can advance a variety of energy policies, um, inform regulatory processes, and support energy technology research, demonstration, and deployment. And state energy offices are funded by state and federal appropriations, and they're based in various offices within a state. So, for example, the Montana Energy Office is located within the Montana Department of Environmental Quality. Next slide. And just a quick overview on some of our programs and priorities. I won't read them all to you, but NASIO does have several committees, task forces, regional meetings, and other informational events to share best practices um, related to state energy programming and planning. And these are just a few of the topical areas we work on at NASIO. And our microgrids work is based out of our electricity program area, but obviously has intersections in most, if not all, of our other program areas. And so state energy offices have several different options related to microgrids. Um, a state energy office can help to develop a statewide definition of microgrids or a statewide definition of resilience, which really helps improve understanding on the state level about these projects and also provides clarity. Um, just for some quick examples, the Minnesota Department of Commerce, which is the state energy office in Minnesota, and the California Energy Commission have um, both developed microgrid definitions that have helped really improve uh, coordination with a variety of external stakeholders. And then those state energy plans that each state develops can also really highlight the importance of resilience activities within a state and also highlight um, the role microgrids can play in really supporting resilience efforts. Uh, the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection and the Oregon Department of Energy have all highlighted um, the importance of microgrids to meet their state resilience goals within their plans. And that's often led to uh, specific legislative actions that led to state funding to support these efforts. Um, and in addition, state energy offices can support community level microgrid plans or feasibility studies. Um, Puerto Rico did this uh, on an island wide level and the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities um, also provided grants to over 10 communities to study uh, possibility of microgrids at different critical locations. And finally, uh, state energy offices can fund microgrid programs. I'm gonna dive into a lot of these possibilities later on in this webinar, but um, there's a lot of different options, whether it's supporting critical locations, supporting low to moderate income communities, um, Maryland's Resilient Maryland program, really focused on this. It funded microgrid projects specifically, specifically targeted uh, towards underserved communities. And with that, I'll turn things over to Kira to discuss some more specifics on state energy offices and PUCs, and then I'll dive back and do a little bit more specifics on the funding and financing side. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, so it can be kind of interesting to think about the similarities and differences between how commissions and energy offices look at microgrids. And based on our, our time working with members of both of our organizations, we really see resilience as the primary motivator for commissions and energy offices, taking a look at regulations and policies and programs that can support microgrids um, as a way to reduce the impacts of outages on either ratepayers or uh, communities. So public utility commissions oversee how utilities spend ratepayer dollars and try to ensure that the distribution system is safe, affordable, and reliable. And state energy offices manage state and federal funding to support energy investments that benefit communities or further state policy goals. So on the next couple of slides, Kelsey is going to share um, some research into how microgrids are funded and financed.
Thanks, Kira. So yeah, I'm going to kick things off by talking a little bit more about funding and financing opportunities for microgrids. This is really based on a publication Nazio and Nehruk put together last year. Um, the paper was authored mainly by one of my Nazio colleagues, Sam Kramer. So if there are more specific questions on the different, fi different uh, financing mechanisms, I'd be happy to connect you with Sam um, to provide more details. But there really are a multitude of private, state, and federal funding and financing options that will help enable resilient, affordable, and clean energy microgrids. Next slide. So this chart um, demonstrates how there are several uh, cost drivers during the microgrid development process. Um, it specifically looks at cost per component for various microgrid classifications. This can be campus microgrids, utility, community, and commercial or industrial microgrids. And I do want to note that utility-owned microgrids are usually the largest microgrids, so overall costs for these projects tend to be higher as a result. But the main drivers that, that uh, contribute to the cost of a microgrid uh, include feasibility studies, the engineering design and business planning, construction and operation and maintenance. And just to dive into those a little bit deeper, uh, feasibility studies are when you look at a potential site for a microgrid and really assess the various options for con uh, configuring the project, You know what kind of fuel you might want, um, what the power source is that you wanna use, whether it's um, solar and battery storage or solar and a diesel generator. And this is also that phase where you look at all the possible revenue streams for the project. So. Um, costs can really vary for these studies, and um, states often bring in private partners to really support these efforts. Um, and the engineering and business planning phase is when you take the results of those feasibility studies and the needs of the customer to really actually design the microgrid that you want for a specific location. And then the third phase is that construction of the project, which includes getting equipment and labor, which can be a challenge depending on the location of the project. And then getting the generation assets is a really expensive piece of that phase. And it accounts for about 54 to 76% of a microgrid's total cost. And then that final phase is the operation and maintenance costs. And those are ongoing and will vary really significantly state to state, depending on the role of the microgrid, what the service is it, uh, what service it's providing, and where within a state it's located. Uh, next slide. So now I'm going to outline some of the potential revenue streams available to finance microgrid projects. Um, microgrids really do have a design flexibility to use one or more of these revenue streams together. So you don't really have to look at this as one or none. Um, there are opportunities to combine revenue streams, and this really depends um, kind of on what the owner of the microgrid is looking to accomplish. So first are federal, state, or utility incentives. Um, these can include federal investment tax credits or renewable energy credits, and then reduced energy costs. This can occur when customers install energy efficiency measures or incorporate renewable energy into their project. Um, this is especially helpful in areas with high electricity costs. And then demand response programs are run by electric utilities, and they really help customers save money um, by encouraging customers to reduce your energy use, and this is particularly valuable um, during times of high demand. And then these are examples of um, some electricity exports that could be net metering or feed-in tariffs, and they exist when microgrids sell excess power back to the main grid. So those are kind of the four most common revenue streams, but I did want to highlight a few other options that are available depending on kind of the regulatory or policy framework of your state. Um, so that'll be ancillary services or microgrid tariffs. Um, they serve to reward microgrids for the services they provide, um, whether it's their islanding capabilities or um, reduction in loss because, you know, significant transmission and distribution lines are not needed um, due to the really localized generation of microgrid projects. And then distribution support service agreements, those are done between a microgrid and utility, and microgrids are paid to support the larger electric grid um, during all conditions, you know, blue sky, steady states, or black sky, really um, natural disaster or other situations. Um, and then local energy market participation involves selling electricity to other microgrids. Um, this is for specific uses rather than to the main grid, as I mentioned earlier. 
And then reduced flood insurance premiums, that's pretty straightforward, but um, basically it's the ability of microgrids to help critical facilities keep the lights on during a disaster. Um, so insurance providers tend to see value in microgrids that can keep power on during a flood, and as a result might offer you know, discounted insurance rates to the owners of the microgrid as a result. And then just the last two revenue streams, non-wire solutions, that has to do with the money saved by a utility for not needing to you know, add additional substations, wires, or poles um, by instead installing a really localized microgrid, and then renewable energy and battery subsidies. Um, which I mentioned earlier and can include renewable energy credits. So those are kind of the plethora of revenue streams available for microgrids. And now I'm gonna look at a couple of the public-private partnerships that exist. Um, many of them do really appear similar on the surface. So I would recommend um, looking at some additional resources that NASIO has for more background and I'll um, drop those links in the chat after this presentation. Um, so the first is energy as a service, and this uses performance savings to pay for microgrid construction. Um, a quick example is in Montgomery County, Maryland, they used energy as a service to finance a project um, that connects the county's transportation management resources, the county's office of emergency management, and a police station. And the microgrid was constructed by the county, but with support from two private companies, Schneider Electric, they built and actually maintained the microgrid, and then Duke Energy, which actually owns the generation facilities. And then energy savings performance contracts, these are agreements between a building owner and an energy service company. So the company actually conducts an audit to determine what savings exist within the building. And once an agreed upon uh, level of energy savings is reached, the company actually will upgrade the building and then the building owner will repay the company through the energy savings it receives as a result. And then I won't dive too much into commercial property assess clean energy or CPACE because I understand uh, your webinar next month is going to talk about that a little more. Next slide. So while private funding opportunities are really a great way to support the financing of a microgrid project, there are also opportunities for states or state-led en entities to um, really provide funding or financing support. So this could be state energy revolving loan funds. Um, they enable state energy officials to use um, an initial capital allocation to offer uh, long-term low interest financing. And then the loan interest, uh, re the loan repayments are then used to uh, receive the fund. And a microgrid in Washington state actually connects a clean energy technology center, a modular data center, and a utility office. And it's a solar and storage microgrid and it utilized um, a revolving loan fund. And then we have grant and incentive programs, state supported green banks, green bonds, competitive grants, and utility rate recovery. Um, these are all additional you know, state, state financing opportunities for microgrids. And then I just wanted to quickly touch on um, some of the federal programs. These include uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency's Building Resilient Infrastructure Communities Program, um, the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, and then the Housing and Urban Development uh, Community Development Block Grants. And those are just some of the options available. Um, and these federal programs can also be used to support other state and local government funding um, if they're just looking for additional supplemental support or technical assistance. Um, and I was just gonna quickly touch on um, state energy officials can often utilize state energy program funds um, that come from the Department of Energy. Uh, for example, Kentucky used state energy program funds to conduct a regional microgrids for resilience study. So there's a lot of different options um, to combine or utilize different state and federal financing opportunities. And then last um, in the financing and funding space, I just wanted to quickly touch on State Energy Office and PUC um, commission actions in this space. Um, state Energy Offices can coordinate with PUCs on these projects, as well as municipal or rural electric cooperatives. Um, and just a quick overview of some of the actions that I mentioned earlier, but just really break down. Um, we have developing new rate structures, establishing public-private capital financing, this includes the CPACE program. Um, they can provide public funding. They can provide comprehensive technical assistance and support to customers. And this is often more straightforward than um, private financing agreements. 
Um, also ensuring regulatory certainty for microgrids. And then finally, um, empowering underserved communities to finance microgrids. Um, it's really important to incorporate community voices in both the planning and operation phases. Um, and there also can be opportunities um, for operation or asset ownership on the community level. Um, states can focus on you know, low to moderate income households or energy justice communities when they're developing microgrid programs and really make sure that um, community voices are heard throughout the process. Um, that's all I have on funding and financing. So I'm gonna turn things over to Kira to talk about valuing resilience. Kelsey. Um, so for the next part of the webinar, I'm going to present some highlights from a report that we released um, in February of this year called Valuing Resilience for Microgrids, Challenges, Innovative Approaches, and State Needs. And this was authored by Nazio, um, by Kelsey, by myself on behalf of Nehruk, and by Alex's colleague, Wilson Rickerson, for Convert Strategies. So we started off by looking at how commissions and state energy offices are looking at resilience. Many states are seeing increasing threats to electricity service from extreme weather like winter storm Uri in Texas, Hurricane Ida uh, along the Gulf Coast and wildfires throughout the Western region of the country. These events really demonstrate the interconnectedness of critical infrastructure and just how many services rely on electricity from water treatment to natural gas supply to first responders. As these threats increase in frequency, severity and impact, commissions and state energy offices are expressing more interest in developing solutions that will decrease the impacts of outages on customers and communities. Resilience sort of focuses on three phases of a disruptive event that are shown in the resilience trapezoid graphic on this slide. Uh, this is from a California Public Utilities Commission staff concept paper, but it's sort of seen throughout the industry and I, th I think pretty widely accepted. The system first prepares for disruption. Generally, we have at least some advance warning for threats like extreme weather and things like public safety power shutoffs that we're seeing in California. Although some types of weather or physical or cyber attacks on the grid might occur with very little to no warning. The system then responds or adapts to the disruption in this kind of middle uh, sort of pink phase. Um, and then finally, the system recovers to a pre-disruption level of service on the right. So distributed energy resources like microgrids are of particular interest for resilience uh, efforts because over 90% of outages occur in the distribution system essentially everything from substations down to the wires that uh, come directly into homes and businesses to deliver electricity. State energy offices and commissions are both responsible for overseeing investments in energy infrastructure, and they really wanna maximize the benefits of their spending, whether it's ratepayer dollars or taxpayer dollars. So it's important that we try to understand how microgrids and really any type of investment in the energy system can contribute to resilience and understand how we as regulators or state energy offices can properly compensate resources for providing resilience services. In practice, commercial and industrial customers are using microgrids already to avoid costly outages, particularly for facilities like data centers, where even a brief interruption in electricity can result in substantial damages and lost revenue. Municipalities are also increasingly considering either single or multi-facility community microgrids, to power life-saving functions like heating and cooling, medical services, and other capabilities for community members. Microgrids can be located in front of or behind customer meters and can provide benefits during normal conditions or blue sky conditions, in addition to resilience benefits during disruptive events or black sky conditions. The unique aspect of microgrids compared to other types of resources is that microgrids can operate in parallel with and islanded or independently of the distribution system to support uh, critical load within the boundaries of the microgrid. So we include some examples of how microgrids support resilience in the paper. And a few I wanted to pull out to share today include microgrids with battery storage that are sited at substations throughout California to help decrease the impacts of public safety power shutoffs that are driven by wildfire conditions. There were also several natural gas powered microgrids throughout Texas that were able to provide backup power to customers as well as ancillary services to help stabilize the Texas grid during winter storm Uri last year. In Hawaii, there's a 50 megawatt microgrid that operates at an army base um, that's situated above the tsunami zone. So in the event that there, th that there is a tsunami, the microgrid would not be impacted and it would be able to provide black start services to the island to help jumpstart uh, the entire grid in the event of a tsunami. And uh, lastly, the Brownsville community microgrid in Chicago uses natural gas, solar, and storage 
Um, it was partially funded by ratepayers and, and partially from Department of Energy grants and some other sources. And it helps provide community resilience by powering a police department headquarters and other public buildings uh, within a, a footprint that covers several blocks. So we note in the paper multiple examples of commissions being hesitant to allow utilities to spend ratepayer money on microgrids in return for unquantified benefits to resilience or broader societal benefits like public safety, national defense, or economic growth. Commissions have pretty clear boundaries as to what types of benefits can be considered in regulatory decisions. In some cases, regulars have rejected ratepayer funded microgrids for failing to quantify the value of resilience. In cases where regulators have approved investments, they often emphasize that they're doing so kind of on a pilot basis to enable the utility to quantify the benefits of this project um, and then factor those lessons into the future. Uh, this tries to help ensure that ratepayers are actually benefiting from these projects. State energy offices also play an important role by providing funding or other support to microgrids that support public safety or other state policy goals, as Kelsey just mentioned. While state energy offices might have more flexibility than commissions in factoring those kind of broader benefits into their decision making processes, like commissions, they're working with limited resources and want to prioritize projects that have the greatest resilience impact. Many state energy offices and commissions have expressed interest in valuing resilience through state energy plans and commission orders, but they're generally unsure how to proceed given the many difficulties around valuing resilience. So there are um, a few methods in development that we reviewed in initially in a 2019 publication. Um, these methods generally fall into two categories. There are some bottom-up approaches that rely on survey data or actual customer behavior in order to estimate customers' willingness to pay to avoid an outage. And second, there are some economy-wide approaches which use economic models to estimate the financial losses of an outage across a given geographic area. <laughs> The Interruption Cost Estimate, or ICE Calculator, which was developed by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and the Department of Energy, sort of emerged as the industry standard for valuing resilience. The ICE Calculator uses survey data from customers of numerous uh, US electric utilities to establish a value of lost load. However, it does have some weaknesses, mainly the survey data is a little bit old, it's not representative of the entire country, and it only reflects outages of up to 24 hours, um, making it difficult to apply uh, to longer duration outages. So um, in this report that we put out a couple of months ago, we sort of revisited these value of resilience methods as many of the methods we saw in 2019 had evolved and some new approaches were also emerging. So we summarized five tools and methods in our report. Um, I, I won't go into them uh, right now, given the time, um, but I'm happy to put the report into the chat and uh, I would love for you all to take a look. In the final couple of sections of our paper discuss how commissions and energy offices are looking at resilience in decision-making. On the commission side, we're seeing some decisions on rate pair funding for specific microgrid projects um, proposed by utilities that are based partially on quantified resilience benefits or an expectation of doing so in the future. A couple of states, uh, Hawaii and California, have approved rate structures for microgrid customers, and there are some proposals in progress in other states. Um, and some utilities have also proposed resilience as a service rates in which customers can voluntarily procure resources that will provide resilience by paying an adder on top of their regular rates. Um, so in the, in the interest of time, I'll pass things back to Kelsey for uh, the next couple of slides. Thanks, Kira. Yeah, I'll move quickly through these so uh, we can make sure to have some time for Q&A. But Nazi and Nehruk are currently developing a paper on clean energy microgrids, and the paper is still really in the review phase. But I wanted to share some, some highlights with the group before we wrap up. Next slide. So currently, combined heat and power is really the most prevalent power source for microgrids. And then solar, wind, and hydropower combined make up really less than 10% of the currently installed microgrids. Um, they usually end up utilizing diesel and natural gas and clean energy microgrids are often powered by solar paired with um, you know, a diesel generator or battery storage. And this is really needed to maintain reliability and resilience. 
And a few of those storage options for clean energy microgrids, um, obviously batteries, flow batteries, hydrogen or kinetic energy storage. And a project in North Carolina, um, it built a microgrid test site that serves a fire station and it has a 50 kilowatt solar installation and a 500 kilowatt a lithium ion battery and then they did a test run of the location and it really demonstrated that the microgrid was able to sustain energy for up to 26 hours and obviously at a fire station this is particularly valuable you know during an energy emergency or natural disaster and then i just wanted to quickly add a little bit more to what alex mentioned about the one project in the doe database in montana um, it's the northwestern energies beck hill rural microgrid project located in deer lodge and that microgrid is actually made up of a 40 kilowatt solar system um, so supported by an 80 kilowatt battery. And this microgrid project serves as a test site for potential future projects in the state. Um, and it works to um, improve resilience and electrical reliability of 17 remote rural customers in the area. And I do have a link with more information that we can um, share with you after this. Next slide. So while wind, solar, and hydro are currently the main clean energy options for microgrids, uh, there's a lot of potential. I know you had um, a webinar on nuclear energy um, several months ago, so nuclear microreactors and small modular reactors are a great um, microgrid potential. Renewable hydrogen and fuel cells, micro hydro systems, geothermal, and new battery technologies. Um, there is a project in Maryland that's looking at developing a solar-powered microgrid and they're gonna place it at a bus station um, to charge electric buses in the county, and then also use excess generated electricity to produce renewable hydrogen fuel. Um, so there are obviously a plethora of opportunities um, to utilize new clean energy generation and storage technologies for microgrid projects, but um, a lot of these haven't gotten off the ground yet are still in the research phase, but um, it's exciting to see the possibilities. And next slide. So there are a lot of benefits provided by clean energy microgrids um, encompassing both the energy and non-energy sectors. Um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, you know, decarbonization and resilience benefits are really critical um, for states looking to cut carbon emissions, bringing more renewable energy generation online can really help meet those decarbonization goals and also serve to displace um, other fossil fuel generation. And renewable energy microgrids paired with battery storage can also eliminate that need for fossil fuel backup I mentioned earlier. Um, those diesel generators can really re um, require complex interstate fuel deliveries and can also leave communities struggling with delayed shipments or lost product. And this is um, a particular concern for remote and rural areas. Um, they're really at risk of fuel scarcity and you know, having that local renewable energy generation is really important in those areas. Um, and then renewable energy microgrids paired with battery storage, they can continue providing clean energy if there is a disruption or a blackout by islanding themselves from the main grid. Um, this is really valuable at critical infrastructure locations. Um, not sure how many of you read about it, but the US Army um, recently released their new climate strategy, and it includes a goal of providing 100% of the electricity at all of their installations um, by carbon free sources. And then they also want to install a microgrid um, at every army installation. So all their bases, all their stations, um, and this is really to increase resilience and also um, decrease their emissions. And then upgrades and modifications to the grid are needed to accommodate you know, additional distributed energy resources. And microgrids are really helpful at um, increasing DER integration and while keeping costs down and not impacting the power quality. So it's really easier for microgrids to incorporate um, renewable energy sources as the main grid is really dealing with a lot of um, congestion and a lack of transmission capacity. And the microgrids are also helpful with improving efficiency. Um, one project uh, funded by the California Energy Commission was another bus stop location and they installed a microgrid to try to make it more efficient. They're going to utilize um, an intelligent grid operating system, and that system is going to help them know whether energy should be drawn directly from the solar generation at the bus stop or from the stored electricity. So um, these are just a lot of opportunities to increase the efficiency. 
And then just quickly, non-energy benefits, improved air quality, health and safety, you know, renewable and clean energy um, have a lot of health benefits and really help with cutting down emissions. And then um, an additional benefit is just the value of loss load. Um, that's the economic loss of unserved energy. And it actually represents how much a customer will spend on reliable electricity. So clean energy microgrids are a lot less likely to contribute to blackouts or lead to service interruptions. So um, determining that value of loss load for those kind of systems is one way to estimate the resilience value. And then finally, uh, clean energy microgrids are predicted to contribute over $70 billion to the GDP by 2030. So that's also going to lead to the creation of a lot more jobs. And then I have one more slide, but um, I think we can skip over this since we kind of touched on this throughout the other um, presentations and move into Q&A. Thank you. Great. Um, wow. Well, I don't know about everybody else, but I was busily taking notes the entire time. Um, so thank you all so much for the great presentations. Um, if I can ask our speakers to go ahead and put themselves on video. Um, oops, we'll try and get all of the uh, speakers spotlighted here. Don't mind me as I try and figure out how to do all this. Um, Alex, let's see, I gotta find you. There you are at Spotlight and there we go. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you again so much to all of our speakers. Um, that was an incredible wealth of knowledge and we do have some questions that rolled in. So with our remaining um, time here, we'll just dive right in. Um, first one coming from Marta is, how do we get our local microgrids, for example, solar in Missoula, to work in case of big power outages or for big um, or for peak load times. So I think this is a little bit about, you know, how how to get microgrids up and running. Um, you know, how do you begin that process and, and how do you make it happen? I guess. Yeah, so I'll, I'll venture in here and and and, we'll, and other folks can join me if they'd like. The the initial step is really uh, making sure you understand what loads you want to keep up once the power is down, um, if you are looking for the resilience angle, uh, just because you have some amount of solar, it needs to know what it needs to power. And that'll really dictate how the engineer, how an engineering firm would help you select the right equipment or even you know, electricians will help you select the right equipment to be able to configure it um, for doing uh, power outage scenarios. So I'd say that the very first step is figure out what you want powered when power goes out. And then you can contact someone and say, all right, here's how much I have for my solar. Here's its current configuration, its, its hardware. Here's what I wanna power. And usually they can then help you connect the two um, and work through it. So that would be, be my initial step is, is try to figure out the load first. And once you have that, then you can contact someone. Yeah, and just to, to add to that answer, I think one of the key components of a microgrid is a controller that acts as you know, kind of a, a system to isolate the microgrid from the broader grid in the event of an outage. If you just have you know, a rooftop solar system, that's not going to continue operating during an outage unless you have it kind of specifically configured to, to do so as part of a microgrid. Um, so I think that's an important consideration to, to keep in mind. I'm actually getting rooftop solar on my house, so I'm very excited about it, but I know if there is an outage, um, I, I don't have a battery or a controller, so I'm not necessarily going to keep getting power from that system, uh, but a microgrid would be able to island and keep operating during, during an outage. Great. Thank you both for, uh, for those answers. So um, jumping into our next question, this is maybe an easy one. Um, uh, Rick just asked if uh, you all would share your contact info um, into the chat at some point. Um, that would be great. So I changed the chat settings. You should all be able to do that um, at some point. Um, David asks, um, what are the pros and cons of microgrids in front of the meter versus behind of the meter? Um, are they configured differently? Are there ones that really are configured in front of the meter um, or are they mostly kind of behind the meter stuff? All sorts here uh, in terms of, of in front of and behind the meter. And again, it also depends on how, how large we're talking here. Uh, this was one of the things that we we're actually doing with the, the DOD right now as part of that reset project was helping them try to consider how they would actually 
determine what was best for them in the future and how to do the retrofits and actually add resilience um, to their existing solar assets in these microgrid type configurations. I'll go, I'll try and be really brief and quickly. When it is behind the meter, or I'll say um, on the customer side of the meter, then there's a lot more in terms of controllability. It also is simpler in terms of configuration and electrical protections that you need to do. And it's easier to isolate yourself um, from the grid or wherever your connection point is with the utility. In front of the meter or on the utility side, typically has the benefit of receiving additional funding. Um, some of the things that we were talking about with you know, state-sponsored funding or even utility-sponsored funding is potentially there because it's on their side. And it provides a benefit potentially to more folks uh, than just the customer. So there's a potential larger benefit and potential community benefit there. So real briefly, real high level, at least when I look at front and behind, those are two of the different ways to think about it. Yeah, another consideration with front of meter microgrids is they can provide a lot of benefits by connecting to multiple buildings um, just off of one microgrid. But there are a lot of kind of difficult questions around how that microgrid would be interacting with infrastructure or poles and wires that are owned by the electric utility. Um, so that, that's a really big issue for commissions, especially because they're responsible for overseeing the safety of the, of the distribution system. Um, and utilities also obviously want to know about resources that are connecting to their system and using their infrastructure. Um, so that's been you know, something we've discussed a lot um, in, in our work with commissions and energy offices is, is there, are there ways for utilities to sort of come to agreement with front of meter microgrids to agree on you know, some use of infrastructure and make sure that safety standards are met. Um, but there's definitely not you know, an easy answer, sort of a one size fits all uh, method for, for moving those projects forward. Yeah, and I know interconnection just in general, whether it's solar or microgrid or whatever is incredibly important, right? Um, it's critical for safety, for linemen working on the lines, for the utility to know what's going on. So those are really important uh, questions, obviously. And when you do venture in front of the meter, obviously there are way more stakeholders that need to start to get involved. So th this cycles back to a question that I had actually, maybe for Kira or Kelsey, for one of you. Um, I, I think one of you mentioned that state offices, Kelsey, I think it was you mentioned um, state offices kind of can help create definitions of microgrids and kind of establish maybe some of the parameters. What, why is that needed? You know, like, like how does that help development? Is there, you know, when we look at interconnection agreements or things like that, um, you know, is that something that comes up often or, you know, I'm thinking in terms of me and my neighbor, you know, if we want to put together a small microgrid between our two houses, um, you know, what, what policies and regulations and definitions do we need to make something like that happen? Yeah, I can just start by talking about kind of why it's important to have those, those definitions. And I will say that um, for the few states that have created it, it's usually done, you know, in legislation. And then um, when folks actually want to apply for grants or funding for a microgrid program, they kind of know exactly what kind of project will be applicable to get that funding. And I think that um, makes it a lot easier for you know, communities or developers who are interested in applying for that funding if they actually know what kind of projects will qualify. And I think even right now on you know, the NASIO website and different resources, we kind of rely on the Department of Energy's definition of a microgrid. But I know, as Alex mentioned, there's a lot of different items that can be considered a microgrid. So I think even just having some consistency um, on the federal and state level will be really helpful in getting more projects on the ground. And then I was just gonna quickly mention um, related to the interconnection issue, NASIO does um, work on a solar cybersecurity project with the Department of Energy that really looks at um, some of those interconnection concerns. Um, we're focusing a lot right now on looking at how smart inverters can have cyber uh, concerns. So I'd be happy to drop that into the chat for anyone who's interested, you know, in getting one of those solar projects off the ground and might be curious um, about some of the interconnection concerns or cyber issues there. And Kira and Alex, feel free to jump in there. Um, I don't have too much to add. I mean, I think from the commission side also, just kind of offering utilities and, and stakeholders and folks who might potentially be interested in developing or purchasing microgrids, just giving them kind of a clear definition of what the state regulator would consider to be a microgrid um, is, is, I think, important just to provide some certainty for those projects going forward and kind of give stakeholders a better idea of 
what they need, the information that they need um, to, to move those projects forward. Um, some commissions also, like the New Jersey Commission, have developed sort of sub-definitions within the broader definition of a microgrid, looking specifically at how many customers are connected to it, whether it's in front of or behind the meter, how many distributed energy resources are within the microgrid boundary, um, just to try to highlight, you know, these projects can be simple or they can be very complex and there's, you know, different roles for utilities and regulators, depending on what the project looks like. Excellent. Um, well, thank you both for that. So um, we have one more question that I might sneak in here before we get to the end of the hour. Um, and thank you all for staying late to do some more Q&A. Um, I, I was hoping somebody was going to ask about this, and I'm going to tack a question on at the end, too. Um, David asks, how are microgrids being utilized in utility smart grids? And what are the economic incentives for microgrids being used in smart grid infrastructure? And for me, this kind of wraps into my very unfair question of um, are, are microgrids the future of our energy system? Um, so if anybody has their crystal ball and wants to answer that question, that would be great. Sure, um, I can start. I mean, I think a lot of utilities are proposing microgrid projects as part of you know, broader smart grid or grid modernization proceedings and just positioning microgrids as assets that can help integrate more distributed energy resources integrate more clean energy. Um, and some of the benefits that Kelsey mentioned as well in terms of having microgrids as a, you know, as what we call a non-wireless alternative to uh, meet the needs of the system and, and, and meet reliability needs without necessarily like dedicating entirely new infrastructure to meeting those needs. Uh, microgrids can be a way of deferring those um, uh, infrastructure costs that might end up being more expensive. Um, are, are microgrids the future of, of uh, utilities or the future of electricity? Um, I think they're definitely going to continue to be a big player and continue to grow, especially given um, all of the threats to electric service that we've seen in recent years with extreme weather um, continuing to get worse, cyber threats and, and physical attacks being on the horizon. Um, so I think more and more municipalities, private customers, uh, large commercial and industrial customers are really looking at microgrids as a way to meet their needs during an outage. Um, Kelsey or Alex, did you all want to add anything? I would just say that, you know, on the federal side, there is a lot of interest in microgrid projects, you know, with the infrastructure investment and job acts, there's a lot of funding specifically targeted towards, you know, distributed energy resources and microgrid programs. And I think there's going to be a lot of interest in those kind of uh, smart microgrids, you know, that can offer demand response or frequency regulation. And that's the only concern I think that NASIO is really looking at in that space is, again, that cybersecurity angle, you know, a microgrid that um, can connect to the main grid if there is, um, you know, uh, a hacker gets into the controller system or something that could be really detrimental. So just making sure, you know, that states are prepared um, as they integrate more microgrid projects and smart grid capabilities to be aware of those concerns. And I'll try, try really lightning here is the way I think about it, most of our electricity right now is created by very large, very centralized plants, typically not near the end of use. And I look at all the pieces in the chain and you kind of look at what's happening in Ukraine right now, where if you're so reliant on a fuel and it's so centralized, then it makes it easier to disrupt a very large amount of folks. And so the, the question of, is it the future? I think it's potentially a more secure future. I don't know if it'll happen or not, but by having more distributed energy being used to provide power locally, it is much more difficult to disrupt the sun, disrupt the wind, disrupt storage, even disrupt your own diesel generator in local stores in your area than what it is to do it in the Gulf Coast at maybe a major refinery plant. So there's that kind of national security aspect that plays into it that this is actually very beneficial for and, and helps us uh, make it a larger and more difficult to attack um, surface. Yeah, well, thank you for, for all of that. Yeah, and I think that resilience piece obviously echoed through the entire presentation and, and it's such an interesting uh, element of microgrids and kind of what they are. Um, so uh, we are now past the hour. So I just wanna thank all three of you again so much for joining us. Um, and sharing your knowledge and your expertise and all of the resources that you shared, um, and particularly for staying on later and, and answering some additional questions from our crowd. Um, so I will plug, of course, the um, 
Uh, next iteration of the Exploring Energy series, we're going to be going over commercial property assessed capital enhancements, which is what Montana calls RC PACE program on uh, May the 4th um, at noon Montana time. So um, again, thank you all so much for joining us uh, to our speakers, to all of our attendees, and we hope to see you again in May. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.